Amen. Second Amen. Corinthians chapter Amen. seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. And spirit. then we'll look at Titus chapter two. Second Corinthians chapter seven. And then we'll look at Titus chapter two. The Bible says right here when we look at verse thirteen. Verse thirteen. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joy we for the joy of Titus, because the Spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. I want you to look at chapter 8 as well, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and notice what Paul recommended about Titus at verse 23. Verse 23. Verse 22, by context, 22 by context reads, And we have sent with them our brother, Titus, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. For our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. You know, I would like this verse to mention my name. What if it was my name that was mentioned right here? And the Apostle Paul was the one that said that Gene Kim is my partner. He's my fellow helper. I proved him, and he was very diligent. He is very diligent, and even more so. A lot of times, if I'm going to be honest like you, I do not fulfill my duties as much as I should. And I'm sure you feel that way too. Mm -hmm. There are times that we fail. There are times that we flop. There are times that we do our very best. We put our heart to it. Yet we still mess up. If there's something that we want. is something like that. Imagine if we mentioned. That Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. Assistant pastor. And close helper. Is. And then they mentioned Jared Kwong. How would Jared feel? Oh my goodness, he would go, my goodness, oh, what a position, what a level of honor. Right. What if they were to mention your name on that? Yeah. But you know, Paul is better than Dr. Peter S. Ruffin. This was the man who went all out for God, who was missionary minded, who's probably the greatest Christian you ever heard about. Imagine he said that, you're my assistant. Wow. You are my helper. Now, if there's a name that I would like is to trade Titus with my place. I would be, I would like to be that person. I would like to accomplish what he accomplished. If there's something you like in your life to serve the Lord, you want to be successful in your life, and you want to be successful in your involvement in God's work and the church. Those are two things that you really want in your life. And I believe that Titus, if we were to look at his life, there's a thing, or two, or three, that we can learn from. And these are three powerful keys that I believe can transform your life, transform your service. If you feel like messing up, if you uh, are hard on yourself, if you wonder, man, what can I do better? Why is it that I keep messing up with the same sin problem? Why is it that I try my best on a certain thing that I keep repeating the same mistake? Preach. You know, my heart's in it, but I forget. Preach. I forget, and then I just mess up. Now, that's what I'm really guilty of right there. Yeah. That's why I always write that stuff down. That's why I always write stuff down. So, it's always a thing that bothers me, but there's three powerful things that we can learn from Titus's life. And that's the reason why your other hand is in the book of Titus. We will look at his life from the book of 2 Corinthians and the book of Titus and see three things that made him a reliable partner and a helper to Paul that I believe that you can learn from. I believe that your name and my name could be written right here as well. And there are, there's probably a thing or two we could learn or maybe three we could learn from Titus. The title of my message is Learning a Thing or Two or three, from Titus. Let's pray. Uh, Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and wash away my sins with your holy blood. Father God, make this sermon come out well, deliver it powerfully, glorify you, be a blessing to these people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now the first thing that we can notice from the book of Titus, chapter 2, there is one word that you'll notice that constantly sticks out at Titus, chapter 2. 
The one word that always pops out, you might say, what is that? Well, in Titus chapter 2, it mentions right here in verse 2 that the aged men be sober. And if you look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. If you look at verse 7, it says, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Uh, if you look at verse 4, it mentions about that they may teach the young women to be sober as well. You'll notice right here that the verse continues on at verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. If you constantly look at the verses right here, the one word that sticks out quite often that Paul told Titus to do that he performed in his life is soberness. Soberness. Seriousness. Taking things seriously. Now, we live in such a laid-back culture. There's no doubt about that in my mind. You, can, you don't have to be a saved Christian. There's one thing I do not like about this area, and it's so laid-back. And because it's such a laid-back culture, you wonder why the economy falls apart. People are more worried about hurting somebody else's feelings and more occupied with making me feel good and you feel good. And because of that, they lost that seriousness to drive the economy, drive their homes, drive the society in a way where it can be successful, learn to endure hard hardship, overcome stuff. No, they're more concerned about well-being and making each other feel good. That kind of stuff makes them take things not seriously. That's one thing I do not like about this culture. That's why you're on a phone call with somebody and it takes like 30 minutes long. You always have to follow up with them. You go to a hospital and then you always get upset and you argue with them. Why? Because they don't, they just want to be laid back. They don't want to be driven. They want to be laid off. They're lazy. They just want to take shortcuts, etc. So that's my impression of the culture here. That's why I strongly believe. And unfortunately, Christianity has followed that cultural trend. Right. It's followed this trend to not take things seriously. It's too laid back. Because of that, that's the reason why you fail in your duties. That's the reason why you're negligent. That's the reason why you're forgetful. Think about it. If we woke up first thing in the morning and then everything that we do in our life, if we took Bible reading seriously, prayer seriously, Mom. church attendance seriously, soul winning seriously, don't you think that it would improve a little bit more? But the problem is, see, we're too laid back. We're thinking always that's like an option. We're always thinking, well, that's something that other people can do. You know, when we go through suffering even in life, we don't take it seriously. In suffering, we play around with it. We mess around. We expect something out there, like a fantasy, some Prince Charming is going to come out from somewhere and then give me something that feels good. And all you do is whine and complain. Yeah. You don't open your eyes and take your suffering seriously and say, hey, get a grip on yourself and then let's fix some problems, some issues here. See, we are very too laid back. If you start to take church seriously, the work of the Lord seriously, the ministry seriously, your own personal life seriously, your children seriously, your spouse seriously, your well-being seriously, seriously in everything, don't you think it'll be easier to serve God? But the problem is, see, we're just, we don't take things seriously. We wake up in the morning and we just do however we feel. However, it's just the norm. What? The norm is what? This culture. And if you follow this culture, is what? Too laid back. See, you don't take things seriously. you got to learn to take things seriously, and it will improve. Titus 2 is all over about seriousness. Think about this. Let's pretend that you're interviewing somebody to take care of some important things. What are the top seven important things in your life? Okay, think about that. So humor me right here and answer it to yourself. The top seven things are most important in your life, all right? If you're a husband, it better include your wife, all right? And if you're a wife, it better include your husband, all right? So, and if you're a father and mother, don't forget your kids, all right? They shouldn't be the least. <laughs> so include the top seven things that are most important in your life. Now, if, you're, if you have to go on a long journey and you're away from those things, you have to have one caretaker. 
And then if you have to interview that caretaker, you say, okay, here are my seven most precious valuable things. You have to take care of it for me. Would you hire somebody who's kind of like laid back like that on the couch? I'm like, sure, okay. And then who's not paying attention to what you're saying and goes, oh, what'd you say? <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Okay, I'll be sure to do that. And that person don't write it down. And you're like, you sure you won't forget? I'm going away for like three months here and you won't forget. Oh, yeah, I got it, you know. <laughs> Five minutes later, you ask them, okay, uh, what did I tell you to do? And then the person's like, what? And then you say, you forgot. Oh, yeah, that's right. You said that you wouldn't forget. Why don't you write it down? This time, write it down. And the guy finally writes it down. You think you're going to hire that person to take care of your seven most valuable things. Preach. And that person will do a good job. No, you're not going to do that. Are you going to hire the person if the person is constantly weak in health and says, well, I cannot guarantee, I cannot commit on these days where I'll be available on all those times to take care of those things. Then you're not going to hire that person. You're going to look for someone else. You're not going to blame that person. Yeah. You're not going to uh, say, hey, it's your fault that your health is bad or you can't be there all the time. No, but you can't trust that person nevertheless to take care of your seven most valuable things. Right. You're not going to do that. You're not going to hire somebody who's like constantly busy that goes, well, I got this work. And I'm just so caught up with it. I got so, many, so much schoolwork that it's not fun, and I got to um, study and st stay up at night. Man, I'm just so tired, and I'm just so bombarded. It's just so hard life, and you're going to trust that person to take care of your seven most valuable things, especially if it's a baby? You're not going to do that. not going to blame the person, but you can't hire that person. Why? You know that person doesn't take that job seriously. Mm. Really? You know what you are? You're called the steward of the mysteries of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are seven mysteries in your Bible. Yeah. And the book of Corinthians says we are the stewards of God's mysteries. Yeah. God has given you seven mysteries. God has given you several things. And you think that if you are God, not you, don't think about yourself being God's worker. You think about being in God's position. If you were God, would you hire you? Come on. You trust you to no. take care of those seven most valuable things? No if way. you were God? See, you got to understand that these things should be eye-opening. Now, it's, it's a given that if you're working for anything, involved in any kind of job, seriousness has to be there. Seriousness has to be there. No boss would hire somebody who's laid back, who makes excuses, who's not there all the time, who's constantly busy and who's not there, who's forgetful, who's negligent. No boss would hire that kind of person. And 90% of our lives, we could be honest, is involved in work, right? Or school, or we're preoccupied with something busy. If you're a housewife, then with raising your kids and taking care of the home, right? 90% of your life is involved in that kind of work, whatever it is. Now, 90% of our lives is involved in that one, but we take that seriously. It's a given. Why? Because I'm getting paid for it. Why? Because it's part of my living, otherwise I won't be able to survive. Why? Because uh, then I'll go homeless. i got to have a roof over my head. I need a roof over my head. Why? Because maybe you have children, maybe you have loved ones, maybe yourself who's starving. I need to put food on the table. So that's why it's a given that we get ourselves serious to whatever work or occupation we're so preoccupied with. But church is less than 10% of your day and time. Whereas work is 90%. And even with that small 10%, you don't take that seriously. That's amazing, is that 90% is your whole work life, this worldly stuff, but you're more, you think it's easier to be more serious on that than the 10%, that small percentage that God has given to you to take care of? Preach. That's amazing to me. Why? Because you're not thinking you're getting paid for that. Yeah. You're not thinking that uh, you're going to starve because of that. You're not oh. thinking you're going to be homeless because of that. That's My true. friend, your piggy bank in heaven is so dry right now. And you're not going to be paid up in glory. No. You're getting paid for what you're doing. Do you realize that? 
You're getting paid for what you're doing. Gold, silver, precious stones, five crowns, things to rule all over this earth. And then you're going to find out that your salary payment on this earth, it was turned to dust anyway. Yeah. It's all worth nothing. Your payment up there is far more important. Yeah. Yeah. So why can't you take that more seriously, God's work, than this work on earth? You know, uh, your gold, silver, precious stones build up your mansion, your room in heaven. How many people are going to be homeless at the millennial reign of Jesus Christ? Yeah. So you're going to have no roof over your head for a thousand years. Wow. You're going to have no roof over your head for a thousand years, and here's your mansion in heaven that you're trying to build up. Yeah, your rent money or your payment for a home is depending on your work. you got to take it seriously, otherwise you're going to be homeless. You're going to be homeless. You know why people uh, take work seriously? Is because well, my children are starving, or I'm going to starve. I need to uh, feed well, my friend. Uh, your spirit up there is starving to death. It's homeless. It's starving to death. Your spirit's up in glory right now. For some of you who didn't know that, right. at Ephesians chapter two or chapter three, your spirit's right there up in heaven. It's homeless. It has no roof over its head. It and it's starving to death with no money. It's homeless out on the streets. It's starving. Can't you hear that baby inside you crying out? I am so hungry. When are you going to open that book and read the Bible? Maybe. That baby's crying out. Man, please feed me. I'm dying. When's the last time you're going to pray finally? Please get to church. I need to hear the preaching. I need to hear the teaching. You know, right now what's going on? Your baby's being fed right now. Going, oh, finally, at last you took me. You gave me a meal. Oh, I was dying. Right? Some of you, right? Didn't you feel like dying? That your baby was dying inside and then it's like being fed. And, oh, at last. At last, I'm feeding it. One thing why people take job very seriously is because they don't like the shame of being that guy, that person holding the sign. Begging, crying, and the clothes all tattered, and uh, it's not the person's not fully clothed well, maybe a little bit half naked, and the shame, and the stench, and the holding a sign, and the sign says basically homeless or need money. That's why people take jobs seriously. They don't want to end up like that. My friend, for a thousand years at the millennium, here you are. Your clothes are in tatters. Because your clothes are your garments of righteousness depending on your work. Yeah. And some of you are, let alone tatters, some of you might be lucky if you have a little loincloth. You might just be butt naked. And yeah, you're holding the sign, and the sign is, I shamed my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I didn't work for Him. Backslider, that's what your sign will read. All right, messed up failure, that's what your sign will read. Homeless, that's what your sign will read. The shame. The shame for a thousand years. Yeah. I think it's time to take our work seriously. Because your boss is looking at you at the working hours of the clock. And here you are just playing your video games. Relaxing, chilling. You know, not taking your job seriously. Your boss is counting the hours, counting your pace. He's watching you. Time to take our work seriously, is it not? Is it not? We have to take our work very seriously. I want you to look at Luke 19. Luke 19. The preacher. Luke 19. Now, notice right here the steward is given a task to take care of the master's property. And he is picturing us taking care of God's property in the millennium. As he enters into the millennium, excuse me. We're going to look at Luke 19. Luke 19. Now the steward right here, he didn't do a good job. He didn't take care of God's property very well. Now when you look at the book of Luke, chapter 19, the Bible reads right here. Let's see, at verse uh, 20. Verse 20. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. 
And he saith unto them, him, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. So notice right here that the servant didn't do a good job. Look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Why? He was lazy. Because Matthew 25 repeats the same story and mentions that the servant was actually lazy. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 26, the Lord, he answered to that steward the following words. Verse 26, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not straw. So the servant was lazy. The servant didn't do anything. What did he do? Verse 25, he hid the talent in the earth. Now think about this. I've always wondered, when you go back to Luke, uh, we'll, we'll look at Matthew 25. When we look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 15, verse 15, the master is giving his property to these stewards, all right? All right, take care of my property. In verse 18, if I was given that at verse 18, I would probably use it for my benefit. But verse 18, but he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. I would either benefit, if I'm going to be selfish, I'm going to benefit off of it, or I would get rid of it. Why does it say he'll hide it? Hide it. Because he can't hide it. You can't get rid uh, of Excuse me, he can't get rid of it. It's something, notice right here, when the Lord came, when the Lord came, at verse, uh, let's see right here, verse 19, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And then notice right here that at verse 24, the one who received the one talent, the one who hid it, at verse 24, he brought that talent. Why, why didn't he left it hidden? Why didn't he get rid of it? Why didn't he benefit off of it? Or like that Lord said, give it to the bank. Why did, why did he bring it at the end? You know why? Because what God has given to you, you know you can't get rid of it. No matter how hard you try. You can't get rid of it. The best you can do is hide it. So you hide it deep down inside. Pretend working for the Lord is not there. That your serious stewardship for God, that God's property that he's given to you, is not there. And you pretend that it's not there. You hide it deep in the earth. But you can't get rid of it. You know that. You know that when at the judgment seat of Christ, God says, all right, show it to me. Guess what? You can't get rid of it. And you can't hide it anymore. You have to bring it and show it to him. All that stuff you pretend didn't exist that you don't want to think about, guess what? You have to think about it at the judgment. You have to bring it at the judgment. You can pretend all you want, you know, coming to church and then, you know, living your own life and those sins and those issues where you're not taking the work of the Lord seriously do not exist. But guess what? At the judgment seat of Christ, they'll all be exposed and you do have to bring it. You will bring it. You will bring it. Somewhere in the deep corners of your heart, there's that pride issue there. There's that fear of something that you got. There's that bitterness right there. There's that laziness, that sin issue. Something that you did not take the work of the Lord seriously in your life. And right there, it's hiding. And all this time, you deceived yourself thinking you never had that issue. And you've forgotten about it. Why is it hidden? Because if God showed it to you right in front of your face, the judgment seat of Christ, Himself, His property, you probably take it more seriously. But it's hidden. Why? It's hidden through fleshly eyes. It's hidden through fleshly feelings. It's hidden through fleshly thoughts and imaginations. It's hidden with the world around you, with its glittering lights, its own job opportunities, its own dreams and valuable, precious, pretty things in life. And people are so occupied on those fleshly means, they don't have time to see the talent that they hid deep down inside the earth. They hid it really well. But at the judgment seat of Christ, guess what God does? He, remove, he removes those fleshly means. He removes those fleshly eyes. He removes those fleshly imaginations. He, take, he burns up all those pretty things around the world. 
And finally, your spiritual eyes get open and that talent that's hidden deep on the earth is revealed. And God says, right there. We need to talk about this. You know why you don't take the work of the Lord seriously? You pretend it's not there. You pretend it's not there. It's hidden deep down inside. Right there. That's the reason why you don't take the work of the Lord seriously. You don't do any work of the Lord seriously. That's why you keep forgetting. You keep messing up. And then you fail here and there. Why? Because you don't take it seriously. Why don't you take it seriously? You hit it deep down inside. You don't like to think about it. You don't think about it. I know you don't want to think about it now. I, don't want, I know you don't want to hear about it right now. But trust me, you do. Because... When God preaches on this pulpit to you at the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to feel a lot worse. Right. He's going to say harsher things than me. Yep. That's right. It's best to hear it now. Amen. So it can be a little bit, at least a little bit lighter up there. Amen. A little bit lighter up there. What have you been hiding deep down inside? Which is why you haven't taken the things of the Lord seriously. What have you been hiding deep down inside? It's time to get those things out. You might say, why do I have to take it out? I don't want to take it out right now. Fine, but at the judgment, you will. And God will take it out right there. Oh God, I don't want to. Come on, come on. You can't hide it anymore. Give it, give it. Here it is. The talent. All right. You that you are a hard and austere man that you won't go easy on me at the judgment. What do you think God's going to do? Oh, I feel sorry. No, no, no. God's going to say, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew you would have it hard at the judgment. That's good. we got to take the work of the Lord seriously. But we don't because we've hidden it. We've hidden it deep down in the crevices of our heart. We don't think about it. We hide it with too much of the world, too much of the job, too much of your feelings, the flesh. That hides it pretty good, doesn't it? You hid it deep, deep down on the earth. Look at 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, 8. We know that famous passage, right? Some of you can probably quote that verse, right? The verse says, Be sober, be, vi be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Why do we have to be serious? Because of Satan. But a lot of times we don't pay attention to that verse. In that verse, we should be serious because Satan is going around like a roaring lion, Lion, what does it say? Seeking. Did you check that verse out before? You know why you should be serious? Because the, the devil is seeking. Yeah. What does seeking mean? It means searching. What do you think that lion is searching for? What do you think he's searching for in you? Yeah. You ever thought about that? What is the devil right now, if he's a lion and he wants to eat you, what is he right now trying to search for? In you. That's good. Obviously, your weak spot. That's good. Yep. Amen. Amen. But you never see those weak spots well compared to the devil, huh? Wow. Sometimes the devil knows your weak spot better than you. Why is that? Because the reason why is you never took your life seriously. But the devil takes your life seriously. It's a hunt for him. It's his food for the day. He takes it seriously. You don't. You know. This is survival we're talking about right here. If you were to take your life seriously, you protect yourself from the devil. You know how you can take your life seriously? Realize there's a lion out there and he's searching for your weak spot. And that would open your eyes and you probably change a lot of things and take things more seriously. It says because you're an adversary seeking whom you need to bow. So, you ever thought about this? First thing you do when you wake up in the morning, you ever thought about, what is my weak spot the devil's going to hunt for now? Mm -hmm. You ever done that before? That's good. That's good. As soon as you first thing wake up in the morning, you ever told yourself, what is the weak thing that the devil's going to hunt for today? Do you think that it might transform your life after that? Yeah. Maybe you'll cover all your nooks and crannies better. Mm -hmm. Maybe if it was written out this time so you don't forget it. Maybe if you finally surrender those things to the Lord and pray those issues to the Lord, first thing. Then your life can be more serious. 
And if you take your life seriously, how can a person fail at the judgment seat of Christ? Mm -hmm. Amen. We don't take things too seriously. We're too comfortable. We're too lax. Preach. All right. The second thing from Titus's life that we can notice is if we look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Titus 2, 14. Learning a thing, which we did, seriousness, or two from Titus. So what's number two? Encouragement. Yes. Encouragement. That, yes. that uh, joy. Yes. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Titus knew this from Paul. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, yes. zealous, zealous of good work. Yes. So there's that zeal, that stirring up. That person's encouraged to do good things for the Lord. Yes. All right. Coming to church is hard. I know, long drive, and you had an awful day and stuff like that. But what if you were to encourage yourself, I need a water to drink. I am so thirsty. Man, I can't wait for that water there. I can't wait to see that brother and sister in Christ where I can laugh with them. Talk something clean. I've been in an ungodly environment. It's just good to be in a godly oh, environment and be something clean. And Man, I can't wait for that first hand. At that first hymn, I'm going to probably shout amen. Or amen. at that first ver couple words in the first verse, I might just cry. Or I might just sing and just feel better. I just can't wait for that day. I wonder what pastor's going to teach and preach. Green-blooded aliens on the earth. <laughs> oh, man, he might preach something that might change my life. I can't wait for that preaching. The word of the Lord. And when you do that, when you encourage yourself... You get to church. The distance and all that is gone. Amen. Amen. The tiredness is gone. See, you got to imagine if you encourage yourself to read the Bible. Man, I want that word to fill up my mind and heart. Encourage yourself in prayer. Man, I just want to talk to God. I need to talk to God. I want to. I want heaven to hear me. I want God to hear what I have to say. And I want God to speak to me. Let me open that book. If, imagine if you could encourage yourself. Imagine if you encourage yourself that, man, it's so good to be clean. Amen. Yeah. Yes. And not to just sin today. Yeah. I don't know about you. The number uh, one of the greatest things I want to do when I get to heaven is do whatever I want and it's not sin. I don't sin. Hey. I don't hurt God's feeling again. Amen. Well, why can't we do that today? Why can't we encourage ourselves? Man, I imagine a day that I don't sin. I don't mess up today. Yeah. Yeah. Being clean today. Amen. Man, imagine if some started doing that. Encourage yourself. How can a person fail, forget, be negligent in serving the Lord? Mm. Have a couple holes missing. No, if they encourage themselves. Going through suffering, it's hard and you're in pain. But imagine you encourage yourself. You encourage yourself through that time that God is so good. Man, uh, even though that bad thing happened, I have 2,000 good things in my life. Man, I'm just so happy still. People wouldn't throw away their Christianity easily after that then. Yeah. Imagine if you encourage yourself in serving God. How much happier your life would be. You know, that's why that verse said in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, there's a key here. Why aren't people zealous of good works? You ever thought about why you're not zealous of good works? I'll tell you why. I know why. You know why people are unhappy? This is the number one reason, I believe, why people are not happy when they serve the Lord. You got sin in your life. Sin always makes you depressed. You know that? Yes. You're so used to living in your own way of doing things, which is sin, yeah. but you've been ignoring it. And because of that, that's why when you're singing the hymn, it's not reaching you. That's why when you're reading the Bible and praying, it doesn't mean anything to you. It's boring. It's hard. Why? Because if a person just keeps watching godless stuff on television and wasting hours on video games, how can he have the energy to just and enjoy the reading of the Word of God in prayer? That's right. See, that flesh is so bombarded by sin yeah. that you can't do the work of the Lord. How can a person enjoy so many witnessing to a lost soul when that sin problem is still right there about fear and pride and ego? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
If that was surrendered a long time ago, you'd encourage yourself to soul win and don't care about the mistakes you make. And look forward to somebody hearing the word of God and at least getting the gospel, even if they don't receive the gospel. At least they can hear it. You'd encourage yourself. Amen. It's because of sin in your life. Sin is always the number one issue why you cannot be happy doing the work of the Lord. Preach. Because you're living in sin. Some of you are here in church today and you want me to tell you something shocking? It's sad, but some of you are not happy as you're sitting at this church service. And I guarantee you this, I guarantee you this, it's your sin. I guarantee you this, it's because of sin. Why? Because the verse says when you're zealous of good works at verse 14, it's because of, notice right here, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself the peculiar people. Zealous of good works. You can only be zealous when that crud is gone. See? Amen. When that sinful life is gone. You ever tried that? You ever tried staying away from sin? A day, alright, without sinning, you've done your physical exercise, you've done your spiritual exercise, you've put your mind and your heart in the right stuff, and then you lived your, you lived your days, and then three months passed by. You ever done something like that, and then you're more energetic, you're more happy, you're more in peace and that God's answering prayers more often now and that, man, uh, the Bible reading prayer at church that you thought was hard, boring, or dull, now it became something that, man, I can't wait. Yeah. It's like the scales got off your blind eyes, right? Yes, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. I think the greater majority of you, right? Yeah. A lot of you know what I'm talking about. You know why some of you can't raise your hand? Some of you say, I... Uh, I I don't, I never experienced that. You're still so used to living your own life, aren't you? That sin that you're clinging on to in your flesh. That's the reason why you never experienced the joy of the Lord. To encourage yourself in the Lord, sin must be put away. Sin must be put away. And then you can then try to come to a blowout and then see if the preaching, singing, and fellowship really is enjoyable after that. Now, when we see these passages, another thing to notice right here is when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Titus knew one thing on how to encourage himself to serve God. What did he do? Well, Titus, even though the Corinthian church had a lot of issues... Titus, believe it or not, was looking forward. He was happy to go to church with them. And he had a great time. That's why he was able to keep serving God with the Apostle Paul. Now, if you know the church of Corinth, it is wicked. It is awful, full of sin and messed up stuff. But how did Titus, how was he able to go there and be able to keep serving, the, serving them, serving the Lord, and be happy after that? You ever wondered about that? Especially when Paul said this, which is very funny. I, if we look at Titus, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 13, the last part of verse 13 says, For the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. Uh, as, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so are boasting. Did you get that? I mean, Titus received joy, he was encouraged to do the work of the Lord because the church of Corinth, Paul bragged about them to, to Titus. Hey, they're a church that will get right to God. They'll pump you up to serve the Lord. They mean business for the Lord. They're going to help you out. How can Paul boast that when Corinth is the probably the number one church out of all of the other churches that Paul ministered to? They're probably the worst church. Probably the worst church that Paul wrote a letter to. Do you realize that? Yeah. And Paul was boasting about them. And Titus got a blessing from that messed up church. You know why? The thing is this. In spite of a messed up church or messed up scenario, Paul was not boasting on things that are untrue about them. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't have a problem with speaking tongues and doctrine. No, they did. They have that problem. Oh, they don't have a problem with fornication and uh, sexual stuff. There. No, they did have a problem. He didn't boast about that. 
He boasted about their repentance. Yeah, yeah. He boasted about, hey, let's fix some things right with God. He boasted about their vehement desire yeah, to yeah. serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. He boasted on these things about the church of Corinth. And he said, man, this church is not like any other churches that you found out there about those things. You should go over there. And Titus is like going over there, knowing their weaknesses, knowing their sin problems. But he keeps in mind what Paul boasted about that church. And when he gets there, he comes out enjoying a good time and he's Amen. happy. Amen. I wonder if uh, when we looked up the messed up scenarios in our lives and the messed up scenarios in our church and things that we have, you can point out a lot of holes. You can point out a lot of bad stuff there. But what if you were to stop and just brag and boast about things that are... You don't, it doesn't have to be untrue, okay? You don't have to lie, saying, my life is the richest in the world, you know? No, you don't have to say something untrue. You can brag about, man, the Lord blessed me with this thing that He didn't give to any other person. The Lord blessed me with this home living situation He didn't give to any other person. The Lord blessed me this job opportunity that He, that he didn't give to any other person. That's very rare. The Lord blessed me with a church with people that are so unique, different than any other churches and people. The Lord blessed me with this kind of living. He answered prayers in a way that's so unique and different that God never did to other people. If you were to boast and brag about things that you got, you got, that other people don't have, and you kept boasting and bragging about it, you overlook all that crud, all that messed up stuff that's involved in your life and in this church and only concentrate on the things that are boasted Amen. and then you get happy. Amen. You get happy. Right. You know what you need to start doing in Praise your life? You need to stop looking at all that messed up stuff and all the weaknesses, all the things that make you depressed and oh life could be better, life could be better, life could be better, life could be better. Hey, start bragging about the grace of God. Man, I'm going to mess up again. That's what some of you are thinking about. I'm going to get right with God on the altar today, and I'm 
I'm just going to mess up tomorrow. I know it. I know it. So a lot of you feel, and that's the reason why you don't encourage yourself to keep coming to church, keep reading the Bible, keep praying, and keep serving the Lord, and staying away and fighting against it. You can't encourage yourself to do that because you always have that negative belief that I keep reverting back. I mess up. Well, maybe you'll be happy if you do this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Notice right here at verse 13, uh, actually not verse 13. If we were to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, verse 7, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Okay, so Paul is rejoicing over the Corinthians' repentance. Notice in verse 13, verse 13, Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceeding the more joy we for the joy of Titus. Titus was encouraged. Titus was happy. Why? The context was because of verse 11. The Corinthians repented. They cleared up their lives in sin. Uh, well, I don't know. If I were Titus, then I was the one that kept messing up with the same mistakes. To be honest, from that verse, I would be happy if I was the one who repented. If I was the one that cleaned up my life. If I was able to get my life back together, right? But why would Titus rejoice on somebody else repenting? That's right. Somebody else getting the victory against him, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Not only that, he's rejoicing on somebody worse than him. Right. The Corinthians are far worse than Titus when it comes to failure. Messing up with the same sin problem over and over again. But just looking at their repentance, their fighting against sin, cleaning up their lives, was what encouraged Titus. And I wonder how many times if Titus ever sinned against the Lord, had something he always struggled with, and then just reverted back to. I wonder if he thought about those Corinthians and said, Man, I remember when they were worse than me. Good, and they cleaned up their lives. and Amen. Amen. Man, they're being used by God. You know, I'm in a better place, and I think I can do it much better, too. If not, even better. You know, what would get you happy is if you look at a lot of rotten sinners in this room, or people who got saved by God's grace, people who are more rotten than you, who sin worse than you. You know, you think you're the biggest sinner in the room, you know. Oh, you're so special, aren't you? If you were to find tongues of different sinners out there who are far worse than you with the sins that they've done that you haven't done, the same sin problems they struggle with years and years, and you're like, man, how, how come you're so stupid? How come you can't get the victory? And see them winning souls. Wow. See them memorizing so much scripture. See them how they live for God, having a happy home, how God answered their prayers, how God pulled them through. And you hear their testimony during testimony yeah. time what God delivered them from, what God saved them from, and what they accomplished now. When a person hears all of that, the person with his sin problem will go, well, I ain't worse than that person. And boy, if that person can right. do that, accomplish that much for the Lord, and get victory over that <laughs> sin, and I can do it too! You know, I think it's time, if you're very discouraged about your sin, stop being infatuated with yourself. And thinking and believing that you're the worst sinner in all of history for the past 2,000 years that God frowned upon and has given up on. Before you start thinking you put yourself in such an elitist position like that, because you're so special, you, all right? You're worse than me, and you're worse than everybody here. I get that, okay? You're so special, all right? That's a false belief. Look at plenty of other sinners that God saved their lives Amen. from Thank you, and was Lord. able to use for His glory. Amen. Thank you so much. And when you struggle with that same problem, remember that brother and sister in Christ, nay, thousands of brothers and sisters right. in Christ who are going far worse than you, yet they drag their tails to church. Amen. Yet they never Amen. given up. They keep reading that book. They keep That's praying. True. And they cried like you cried. They felt the same guilt that you felt. If you were in my position, do you know how many people would tell me about their same struggle that they went through and I would always tell them, you're not the only one. I don't know how many of you heard that from me. Right? <laughs> if you were only in my position, the person thinks that there's such a special place of a being a rotten sinner and an utmost failure and I go, 
Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's plenty of candidates lying up, all right? Everybody wants to sign up for the worst sinner category. Yeah. No, I'm the worst sinner. No, you don't know what I did. No, you don't know what I did. We'd all get in a big line in a competition, and it's just so silly. Right. Why don't you smell the coffee and open up your eyes and realize there's plenty of worse sinners out there than you who have accomplished things for the Lord, and God is still merciful, gracious, and still using. And let that encourage you to just let me come to church one more time. Read the Bible one more time. Pray one more time. Stay away from that sin one more time. And you mess up again, then tell yourself this again one more time. One more time. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to... 2 Corinthians, actually we are there, chapter 7, chapter 7, learning a thing from Titus about seriousness, learning a thing or two from Titus, and that's the encouragement, learning a thing or two or three, I know that's not part of the idiom, but let's add or three. The third thing we can learn from Titus is comfort, comfort. If we were to look at 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 7, we read a bit of that. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he, Titus, was comforted in you. So because Titus received that comfort, that's the reason why he actually wanted to come to them again and help them out, help out the Corinthian church. If you look at verse 17 of chapter 8, verse 17 of chapter 8, it said that Titus, of his own accord, wanted to see the Corinthian church. You know that? Did you see that right there? That Titus, of his own accord, wanted to see the Corinthian church. Wow. So he must have received a lot of comfort there to keep up his work. To keep up his work. What would help us keep up our work is if we learn to relax. If we learn to rest, if we learn to comfort, why? Your life is, let's be honest, okay? Your life is hard enough as it is, all right? So you don't need to beat yourself over the head and say, I need to be stronger. You need to learn to wait on the Lord, and that's your problem. You don't like waiting. Yeah. You're like, I want to get all this over with right now. No, the Lord says, wait, just ride the wave, rest in the boat. I want the wave gone. I want to pass this wave. And God's like, no, 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 no. It's going to be there for a long time. No. You need to rest in the boat. So your problem is you're not, com you're not comforting. You're not resting yourself. The Christian road is long and hard. You're not going to get it all done just like that. That's right. It's going to go till the day you die. In that long road, you need to pace yourself. You ever have your own moment time, your rest mode? You ever went on a vacation? Do you know what vacation means? Or some of you forgotten that word. <laughs> Do you know what break means? Do you know what sleep, what relax means? Chill. The devil in the world of flesh. Oh, you gotta chill, dude. <laughs> All right. Devil's like roaring like sea. Who be made tomorrow? And you gotta chill, man. I got the line of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, amen. amen. All right. If you want to, the life is already paranoia as it is, a lot of work and fight. Yeah. You don't need to make it worse. Yeah, amen. You don't need to add more. God will give it to you, and you know that. So you need to chill as much as you can. You need to relax. You need to comfort yourself. How much longer will you last in serving the Lord? In this Bay Area, I was like overloaded and the ones who are closest to me wouldn't understand what I've been going through. Quitting has never been on my mind, obviously. <laughs> Almost every week. Shock, huh? Almost every week. Shock. But uh, why did I last this long? Oh, it's so hard. And, and then when you rest, wait on the Lord, trust in God. <sighs> okay, I can get back to church. What happened to all that drama a couple days ago? Right. Yeah. You'll survive. You think you're going to die. That's the problem. Every time some problem happens, Amen. and don't get me wrong, it is a big problem, but guess what? You're not going to die. You'll still have a roof over your head. 
God will still give the money to you, all right? You still got a vehicle to drive. You still got brothers and sisters in Christ right here, all right? And you are a little bit more wealthy than you think. Yeah. Yes. You will be surprised. You will survive the day, all right? Let that trial come and go. I mean, how many times, think about this, how many dramatic moments have you had in your life where you thought this was it, you're going to die? Yeah, yeah. How many times you thought about that? After 20 times, you still believe that? <laughs> How can you think that, man? It's been 20 times. God proved you wrong already 20 times. Can't you let go and trust God now? Amen. Amen. Comfort. Then you can last a long time serving the Lord. You know that? So Titus received that comfort from what? The church, right? From the Corinthians. You want to be comforted? Get to church. And some of you know that. Some of you know that when you come to this church, you do get the comfort you need through that hell that you have to go back to. Only the devil and the flesh would drive you away from get, getting comfort. You want to last serving God? You want to get out of that hell? Get to church. And then receive some encouragement, some love, some prayer from the brethren, man. Just get to church. You know what gives you comfort? The Bible says the scripture. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's right. Open that book. Read it, man. Comforts you. You know what comforts you? The preaching of the word of God. Yeah. Paul talks about the word where it uh, did stir up our hearts. Right. Yeah. You know preaching and teaching does help you. Yeah, you get the comfort you need. So hear the preaching and teaching of the word of God. What comforts you? Do these spiritual things and you know they work. Yeah. But the problem is, is that, well, pastor, it's just too much work. Pastor, my flesh don't want to. Pastor, it's just so hard. That's the number one thing, all right? How do I know that's the number one thing? Because people told you that? Actually, I'm the one that keeps saying that. Oh, it's so hard, you know, it's so hard to do that. Well, you know, I tried it, but it didn't really work. Mm -hmm. I tried that, but it didn't really work. Well, here's the thing. If you got a cold, and I know pretty much all of you went through a cold or COVID, all right, either or. And if you don't think, and if you think those two are the same, that's fine too, all right. <laughs> I never said that, you two. <laughs> so I know all of you went through that, all right. You know this, right? As soon as you took that Nyquil, man, that flu and that cold was just gone as soon as you drank that up, right? Of course not. It made you feel comfortable after that, right? And of course not, all right? You still got the fever. You still got the burn. But you take it anyway. Why? Because you do know it's healing you, even though you don't feel healed. And then you keep drinking it. Why do you keep drinking it? Because you know that it'll keep healing you if you keep drinking it. Well, I don't see I'm healed. I'm still sweating, and I'm still going like this, and... Oh man, I'm still sick and didn't heal me as soon as I'd taken it. You're not supposed to feel now. It's a process that works within. And it's something that you keep taking, right? We believe that much in pharmaceuticals. Isn't that amazing? We have that much faith in pharmaceuticals that it will comfort our pain. Even though it doesn't heal us at that moment, we don't feel it. But we do know as we keep taking it, at the end, we're healed, right? The pain is gone. You know, that Bible reading and prayer and coming to church when you get there, it may not heal you right now, Come on. but it is sure healing you. Amen. And guess what? One chug is not going to heal you. Mm -hmm. You need to... That's next it, day, that's next it. day, next day, next day. And then when you look back, you do know this, the pain simmers Amen. or is gone. Yeah. yeah. You want comfort? If you want comfort, you need to keep doing it. That's good, Pastor. How can you have so much faith in man and pharmaceuticals, you know? Well, I gotta feel comfort. That's why it's not working. Well, then why are you taking meds then? <laughs> or even natural supplements. Well, however way you treat the cold or the COVID. It doesn't make you feel good right then and there. Unless you drug yourself with something, then you can feel no pain or something. Right. But every, nearly every one of us, if not all of us, 
take some kind of natural supplement or med or our own treatment method, and it does not make us feel good or comfort us right then and there. That's good. And we keep taking it anyways. Why? Because we know the pain simmers and it'll get gone. You keep reading that book, you keep praying, you keep coming to church, you keep singing the hymns, you don't feel good, the pain is, you still feel the pain, but you do know, and yeah, you do know, the pain simmers Praise the Lord. and can even be gone. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, so you want, that's how you keep serving God if you're comforted. Mm -hmm. that's right. If you're comforted. You know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Didn't you know, listen, some of you might think this is blasphemous, but I need you to hear this. It is possible, it is possible, no matter how much Bible you read, you will not receive comfort. It is possible that you can pray your heart out and years can pass by, you will not receive comfort. It is possible, it is possible that you can uh, keep uh, singing the hymns all you want, you will not receive comfort. It is possible that you can do every other means, spiritual means, and you will not receive comfort. Do you know why? Do you know why? But those things work, I guarantee you that. More than any med or natural supplement or treatment out there. I know, and you know those things work. But why aren't you comforted? The verse says that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, Wherefore comfort what? Yourselves. Yourselves. You know why God can't comfort you? You can't comfort yourself. Wow. Right there. Right there. If the only thing why God can't comfort you is if you push him away. Right. You have to comfort yourself. You have to let that word of God comfort you and then you gotta. Comfort yourself. You gotta believe in those words. You gotta apply those words. You gotta believe, relieve yourself of those words. When you're singing, don't just keep thinking about that grief. Comfort yourself. What are you singing about? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? You know why? You don't comfort yourself. Guess what? If you don't comfort, this is important. If you keep waiting for something out there to comfort you, they are. Yep. And nothing will work. Until you're a big boy and big girl and willing to take out that step and say, I'm going to comfort me. Mm -hmm. Until you make that decision, then all these other things God promised will comfort you will come in more easily. Right. Have you ever comforted yourself? Oh, I messed up and I slipped up and oh, life is too hard, suffering's too great and stuff like that. Have you ever comforted yourself? Mm -hmm. Have you ever told yourself, look, you're not going to die. Everything's going to be all right. Let it go. God's got it under control. Amen. You need to comfort yourself. Amen. Comfort yourself. Why is it that you have to comfort yourself? This is the problem. When we look at... Uh, 2 Corinthians 1. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 1 here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It is possible that no matter how much of that spiritual med that you take, alright? That spiritual comfort that you take, it is possible you can engulf yourself and comfort yourself as much as possible taking all these things, but you're still not comforted. You might go, man, pastor, then how am I going to receive comfort? When are you going to end this? Exactly, that's your problem. So you need to hear this one out. The problem is why you don't receive comfort is because you're too comfortable. Can I repeat that again? The reason why you don't receive any comfort is you're too comfortable. Have you ever slept at the most comfortable bed in the world? And then you sleep at that thing too long, you still get uncomfortable? And then you're searching for a more comfortable bed. and No, you already got the number one most comfortable bed. The problem is your flesh is not used to building up its own strength. Its own resilience. 
That's one of the greatest things and gifts that God can give to you. It's not just this, but an immune system that can resist the pain. Talk to anyone. Keep relying on this. That ain't going to make you good until your immune system builds itself up and is strong. It gets better through resilience, through endurance. God, I don't receive any comfort from you from heaven and I tried everything. Why aren't you comforting me? He is. He's building up your weak, broken, deteriorated, messed up, immune, spiritual immune system. Through such enduring and enduring and enduring and enduring and enduring to build it up. So you can finally receive comfort. Second Corinthians chapter 1. What did Paul say right here? He said, which is interesting, he mentioned that consolation goes with something. Verse 5, verse 5. The Bible says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, that's comfort, also abounded by Christ. Keep reading, the Bible says in verse 7, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing, so he knows, he believes, that as ye are partakers of the suffering, if you partake in suffering, so shall ye be also of the what? Consolation. Consolation. That's why when you're going through a really hard scenario in school or work, they'll always tell you you'll get used to it. Right. Why? You're getting, you're enduring, enduring, and then you got used to it, and now it's not painful anymore. You need to build that spiritual immune system. Amen. And that is greater, listen, your immune system building up its strength is greater than the strongest med, the highest dosage that will get to you. Because no matter how strong and how high that is, you get really weaker after that. You need to build up the strength and resilience. That's how you receive comfort. But you're not comforted because you're too comfortable. Praise the Lord, He's putting you through a little bit of discomfort. Amen, Mark. You know, uh, go to Philippians 1, and I'll close it right here. Philippians 1. I was a little sloppy today, but if we go to Philippians chapter 1, and I'll close it off here, and <laughs> patience. Amen. Yes. If we look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, this is one of my favorite verses I've ever heard. Learning a thing or two or three from Titus. Yes. Imagine if we took our service seriously. Man, you'd probably change your whole life. Your involvement in this church would change. Imagine if you constantly encourage yourself in the service of the Lord. Man, you'd always look forward to doing the work of the Lord daily. Imagine if you comforted yourself during service for the Lord. Why, you'd have enough endurance, stamina, and rest to keep going long term. If there's one thing you and I want is to serve God all the way to the end, till the day of Jesus Christ when He raptures us, we, you and I want to do a good work. All of you want that. And it might go in your mind that, you know, that's all good, Pastor. And I've learned some things, but I'm just too weak. And I'm just too flesh. And I have a broken, I have an unbroken record of hearing something and trying to apply the sermon in my life to change my service for the Lord, and I still mess up. Quite discouraging. I would like to inspire you with one verse that can change your life and make you happy as you serve the Lord. I want to tell you that if you have a broken record of not serving the Lord faithfully, good works are not that stellar. It's poor resume of that. God Amen. doesn't have a bad record. That's right. He never fails in His Amen. work. In your life, 
to do the good work. Yeah. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident. Isn't that encouraging? Yeah. I'm confident. Confident. I'm assured. I believe of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you fail in your work for the Lord, I can promise you this, God will never fail in his work in you. Amen. What happens when I fail my work for the Lord and my life messes up? God will never fail his work in using Romans 8.28 to use those bad things in your life for his good. What if I constantly don't take the things of the Lord seriously and I slip up here and there? I don't encourage myself and then I get depressed and I don't comfort myself. God will never fail to cleanse your life with His blood as long as you confess to Him. The cleansing blood will stay faithful and true and just to you. You know, if I slip up here and there, I mean, I messed up in so many today. I failed to pass out that person the track. I fell back to the same sin problem. I didn't do my spiritual duty for the Lord. I failed. God will never fail to speak to you through His Word, to convict you through the power of the Holy Spirit again, just like today. God will never fail you. You might say, man, what if I leave church, best? What if I leave everything? Sure, you can leave. Everyone has free choice. You can leave. But God will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. God will never fail you, even if you fail Him. Amen. Amen. He can. not He gave you that wonderful promise He'll never fail. Amen. He promised that when you mess up, He'll chastise you back to Him out of pure love. Amen. Well, Pastor, I'm not good at disciplining myself. Good, then you got the Lord. He'll discipline Amen. you. Wow. He'll never fail. He will never fail you. Thank you Where they hear some parts you messed up here and there. You can fail me. You can fail anyone else here. You can right. fail the whole church. But God will never fail you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There's only one thing that you can do where he can, don't, where he's not going to do, where he's not going to be able to keep using you. There's only one thing. That's just your free choice. If you choose to say no, yeah. that's the only thing. If you choose to not receive it. That's the only thing that will not make him keep using you. He doesn't go against your free choice. Oh, thank you, Lord. Isn't it encouraging that all it takes is just, yes, Lord. Amen. All it takes is just one step on this altar. All it takes is just giving your heart to God and saying, I yield. All it takes is, Lord, speak to me. All it takes is, Lord, I receive it. All it takes is, Lord, I'm not going to push you away. You just let him in. The only thing that will close it is just, you don't receive it. I'd like to challenge you to just do one thing. I'm not asking you to clean up your life. I'm not asking you to dramatically ch make some changes. I'm not asking you to have a stellar attendance in this church. I'm not even asking for your money or for you to keep reading your Bible faithfully praying. I'm asking you to do only one thing. I'd like to encourage all of you to do just one thing. Just one. Just tell the Lord, Lord, continue your good work in me. Amen. That's it. Every about me, Rashad.